Uh, this is Saturday evening. We're preaching our Sunday message tonight because of a threatened snowstorm. Uh, we're going to look in Luke chapter 7. And we've been there before a couple of times already. And last week we looked at four windows uh, that we have in Luke 7. A window into the perplexity of a troubled heart of one of the best of men, that John the Baptist. Another window into the lovely heart of the Savior as he uh, defends one of his own. It's a beautiful picture of uh, our Lord. A window into uh, the depravity of man, of the human heart. Deep-rooted depravity of man as Jesus talks about the children that wouldn't play no matter what game was offered. And then a fourth window into the regenerated heart which is escape Satan's deception through the new birth, and that's verse 35. Uh, wisdom is justified of all her children. A case, uh, Van, we- Van Whale was uh, speaking to me about the message, and I started pondering what he said, and he kind of primed the pump. So I've got four more windows out of this section uh, that we're going to look at today. We're sort of putting more windows into the text. And a case had a good observation, and I'm trying to satisfy him with this as well as go beyond it. So as we look at this section we've looked at before, and I'm talking about Luke 7, 18 to 35, I want to look at Windows 5, 6, 7, and 8 and add them to the four we've looked at already. So the fifth window is a window into understanding how the Old Testament messianic prophecies often bound the first and second coming together in the same prophecy. We see that a lot in the Bible. We see it in Genesis 49, the prophecy from Judah, about Judah. We see it in Zechariah 9.9, that famous Palm Sunday prophecy. We see it in Micah 5, 1 and 2 the birth in Bethlehem prophecy. We see it in Revelation 12 uh, where the woman gives birth to a baby and the the first and second comings are are mingled there. Uh, There's some very classic examples in Isaiah and that's the the book that primarily um, John was prophesied of and Jesus and Jesus is referring back to. So I'd like to call your attention to some examples from there. Isaiah 9-6, classic Christmas passage. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and that's the first coming of Christ. And the government will be on his shoulder and all the rest of it. That's the second coming of Jesus Christ. Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, Jesus stopped at the end of the sentence and didn't read the last part in Nazareth in Luke 4. Uh, to the, uh, in the day of judgment of our God. He left that out. And he said, today, this scripture, this part of it is fulfilled in your ears. Isaiah, the last part of 52 and 53, the servant song, actually begins with the uh, Jewish people repenting at the end of history, which is the second coming of Christ, and looking back at the first coming. So often these two comings are put together. It's it's something you see quite a bit. And in Jesus' answer to John the Baptist, he referred back to him the miracles that he was doing, the very miracles that were predicted in Isaiah. So we'll look at that in just a little bit. Pauli Tan is a Chinese uh, Christian scholar, I believe he's still living, and he wrote a fine book, of, oh, maybe 30 years ago, I'm guessing, or so, Interpretation of Prophecy. And Pauli Tan uh, wrote this. He wrote a section on perspective of prophecy. And he said the perspective of prophecy uh, means that two or more future events widely separated in time may be, seen, may be seen by the prophet in a single profile side by side. From the hint given in 1 Peter 1.11, we suppose that after the prophets had written prophecy, they sat down and tried to figure the time perspective of their writings. This is because during the transmission of prophecy, The prophets are stationed in space and not in time. Since they stand royally above all conceptions of time, their prophecies naturally 
lack the perspective of time. Now, some of that might have shot right past you, but listen to this illustration. The prophets see future events in their visions just as a common observer would observe the stars, grouping them as they appear to his eyes and not according to their true positions in space. That's an excellent illustration. Uh, because to us, uh, the stars look like they're pretty much close together, and of course we know that's not so. So the prophets see future events in their visions just as a common observer would observe the stars, grouping them as they appear to his eyes and not according to their true positions in space. This phenomenon is also called foreshortening of the prophet's horizon. And since this is comparable to a series of mountain ranges observed at a distance, where peaks would appear to be closer together or even as one, when in reality there are valleys in between. The perspective of prophecy is further known as the mountain peak view. That's an illustration I've heard for years. We're in a 2,000-year valley uh, between the first coming and second coming in the church age. Now, with that, I want you to look at uh, Jesus' answer to John when John said, are you the one to come or should we look for another, and it says in Luke 7, 21, in that same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind he gave sight. And so these men that were sent by John already knew and, and, and knew about the centurion servant that was saved from death and the widow of Nain's son that was raised from death, and now to that when they come, they get this. And Jesus answering said, Go your way and tell John what things you've seen and heard, how the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and to the poor the gospel's preached. Those first are all physical miracles. This is the last one's a spiritual one. And blessed is he who shall not be offended in me. Now we've looked at that already, but I'd just like to touch Two passages in Isaiah. Will you go with me to Isaiah 35? Isaiah 35 certainly is a prophecy of the second coming of Jesus. There's no question about that in the context of this. For instance, in chapter 35, verse 1, the wilderness and solitary place shall be glad for them and the desert shall rejoice and blossom like a rose. And that's certainly a second coming prophecy of blossom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. That's a second coming prophecy. But uh, notice if you will, just real quickly, in verse 5. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. And the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of jackals, where each lay, shall be grass with reeds and rushes. Now, uh, this is a second coming prophecy where the geography and the, uh, the climate of the promised land will be totally changed. And, and yet there's these other things, these miracles in the medical realm and the physical realm. Well, Jesus is actually referring John to this. But these miracles are the kind of things that will happen when the Messiah returns to the earth at the end of history. And just... Knock that, knock that in your head a little bit. <laughs> Slip back to Isaiah 33, <coughs> 24. <coughs> 33, 24. Uh, another prophecy that is definitely at the end of history when Jesus, what we call the second coming, is Isaiah 33, 22. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, and the Lord is our king and he will save us. That's the three offices of government, legislative, judicial, and executive. We separate them in America, or we're supposed to, except for corruption. 
We separate them because we understand men are depraved. But in that coming kingdom, one person will hold all three, and it's safe for that to happen then. It's not safe before then for one person to have power over all three. We're talking about the coming kingdom at the second coming, when Jesus is that person. But in verse 24, the inhabitant shall not say, I'm sick. The inhabitant shall not say, I'm sick. And the people that dwell therein shall be forgiven their iniquities. So, just think about what that's talking about. At the second coming, Jesus is going to do on an incredibly vast scale these kind of miracles that will accompany his return and the setting up of his kingdom in this world, uh, what we call the millennial kingdom. And our Lord's miracles at the first coming accredited him as that person who's going to come at the second coming. That's the whole point of Acts 2.22. So Jesus' miracles at the first coming illustrate his identity uh, and of the miracles he'll, he will do at the second coming. The miracles at the first coming, you could say, were appetizers for the main course that will come when Jesus returns at his second coming. And boy, did he pile them on. Uh, you, you go through Matthew 4, 23, 24, Matthew 8, 16, Matthew 9, 20, 35, Matthew 12, 28. He just piles on the miracles. And so many that a lot of them aren't even told in detail. It's just, you know, here are these people, a whole bunch of people, and he heals them all. doesn't even go into the details. B.B. Warfield in his book uh, on miracles said, disease and death must have been almost eliminated for a brief season from Capernaum and the region which lay immediately around a Capernaum as a center. There's that many miracles. Now these miracles were sign miracles for the one like unto Moses. Remember the Messiah was a prophet like unto Moses, according to Deuteronomy. And Moses was the first man sent to other men with a message from God. The first man commissioned by God to go to the Jewish nation with a message from God and a ministry from God. Now remember, Abraham got messages from God, so did Jacob, so did Isaac, but that was for their consumption and their family. But Moses was the first person in the Bible to be sent to the Jewish theocracy, Old Testament people, with a message from God, and God gave him signs. Remember, he said, they're not going to believe me. And God gave him those three signs. And then he did the ten plagues. And then he did all the, through the miracles in the wilderness. So that was a pattern. And the Messiah would follow that pattern. He would be a prophet like unto Moses, as Deuteronomy says. And so Jesus had those accreditating signs, as Acts 2.22 mentions in many other passages. So what an what a important section this is a window into how prophecy works. Uh, it, so the same window that helped John the Baptist understand can ca- help us understand. Alva J. McLean wrote on this in his wonderful book, The Greatness of the Kingdom, about John the, uh, the Baptist and this particular situation. And he said, under the circumstances, we may well wonder whether John's faith did not begin to waver. And it may have been so, for he sent messengers to Jesus asking wistfully, are you thou he should come or should we look for another? Now the answer of Christ to John not only furnishes an infallible guide to the interpretation of the Old Testament prophets, but also clarifies the exact relation of his own message to their vision of the kingdom. Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. You showed it to him that once. And he asked this question, and now you come back, and now show him these on top of the ones I already showed you. Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor of the gospel preach to them. And this is what McLean wrote. Such an answer was worth a thousand mere verbal affirmations. Jesus didn't say, well, yeah, I'm the one. He just said, John, go reread your Old Testament. Reread the book of Isaiah that predicts you and me. And 
happened. Look at these miracles in that book. R.K. Hughes said, Jesus sent John's messengers back to him with an overwhelming empirical and scriptural evidence that massive messianic power was flowing through him. This was an awesome validation. And the Lutheran commentary Linsky said, the mastery of the answer lies in the fact that it takes John right back into the Old Testament prophecies concerning the Messiah which had caused his perplexity. The very prophecies that caused his perplexity. The very book of Isaiah. And you know, this is a good thing. Often, those passages that cause perplexity to us, if we just read them again and again and again and read their context and ponder them, God will help us to dissolve that perplexity. And I believe it was so in John's case. So the fifth window is, uh, is thinking through what happened here and how uh, Old Testament prophecy mixes the first and second coming often together. And the second coming is just as sure as the first. He that has come is, go- is going to come, right? It's a very past- powerful passage in jo- Hebrews 10. And the first coming was a very well-attested event, according to Hebrews 2, 1 to 4. So well-attested by all those miracles that... Uh, we can get in real trouble if we let that slip. But the second coming will also be according to the scriptures as well as the first. And what a window that is. Number six, a sixth window. A window into the nature of true greatness. Greatness from Jesus' point of view. Not a lot of people use that word great. So-and-so was a great athlete. So-and-so was a great scientist. So-and-so was a a, a great poet. Herod the Great, Alexander the Great, Peter the Great. You know, they put that that label on folks. And the apostles in their uh, pre-Pentecost ignorance even argued among themselves who was the greatest. But everything depends on how you define your categories. What does it mean to be great? We understand great, a great physician, a great pianist, a great general, great this or that. But what do we have here in verse 24 and 28? This is very helpful and very important. And when the messenger of John were departed, he, that's Jesus, began to speak to the people concerning John. What went you out into the wilderness to see a reed shaken with the wind? And what went ye out to see, a man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they who are gorgeously apparelled and live in delicately are in king's courts. John wasn't effeminate. John wasn't somebody that would blow back and forth. What went ye out to see, says it for the third time. It wasn't a weak person. It wasn't, wasn't an effeminate person. What went ye out to see, a prophet? Is that all you went out to see? A prophet? Remember, people were saying he, Jesus was a great prophet. He said, what you went out to see? A prophet? Is that, all, is that what drove you to go all the way out there? Yea, I say to you, much more than a prophet. And in other words, Jesus here says John is much more than a prophet. He's not just a prophet. He is a prophet, but he's more than that. There were a bunch of prophets. There was Moses, and then there was a bunch of other prophets after that, wasn't it? It's incredible people. But you can think of a whole long list of prophets in the Old Testament, both writing prophets and speaking prophets and so forth. But Jesus says more than a prophet. You can't put John the Baptist in the same exact category as um, Samuel, or who wrote a whole bunch of scripture, or even Elijah or even Elisha. They were prophets. And of course there were many more. Nathan. There were many other prophets. John is in that category, but he is also above that category. He's more than a prophet. Um, And according to Jesus, this is he of whom it's written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before thee. 
I say among the, unto you, among those born of women, there's not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. None greater. None greater. None greater born of women from Cain on. Noah, Seth, Abraham, David, millions and millions of people begat, begat, begat in the Old Testament. None of them greater. John was the greatest of all. And even if you put on the fact that prophets were the greatest among the great, he was the, more than a prophet. How is he great? Why is he great? Well, he had national attention. He baptized a whole bunch of people. We know that. But Jesus is going to get ready to uh, define that greatness. And that greatness is defined by proximity to Jesus. Moses, Elijah, and Elisha did more miracles than John did. In fact, John did none. John never did one miracle. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob had more descendants. John the Baptist wasn't even married. Solomon had more wives and more money. John didn't have anything. He's eating locusts and and, uh, clothed in prophetic garments. Methuselah lived a longer life. John didn't even make it out of his 30s. He just barely made it into his 30s. John had no money, no status in the temple He wasn't recognized by the glitterati of the day. No social or financial status. He didn't even have a long ministry. His ministry was very short. What? You know, six months, a year and a half? I don't know. It wasn't very short, no matter how you measure it. He didn't have a long life. He didn't have a long ministry. He was very popular. He brought about, he was a very popular preacher. National repentance took place, even if not everybody uh, repented. A whole bunch of them did. But what made him great was that John is the fulfillment of Malachi 3, 1, and 2. That's what Jesus is saying. This is he, verse 27, it, of whom it's written, Behold, I send my messenger. That's John the Baptist. Before thy face who will prepare the way before thee. And wait till we go back in Malachi, we'll see that that, the messenger prepares the way for the coming of God. And if John's the messenger, that means Jesus is God, but I'm getting ahead of myself. J.W. Shepard said the most wonderful tribute ever passed on a mortal being was what Jesus gave to John. And Jesus now endorses John as the forerunner promised in Malachi as the Elijah who was to come. Norval Geldenhuis, the Dutch commentator, said of John the Baptist, he's the last envoy of the Old Testament, is nearest to Christ, and as thus the most important of all. He takes a lower place than even the most insignificant member, but he takes a lower place than even the most significant member of the New Covenant. He belonged to the a period of preparation and had not yet learned to know Jesus as the crucified one, as the risen redeemer, as the one who through his spirit makes his habitation in the believer's heart and life. He didn't live long enough. Jesus, he didn't live long enough to even see that. Joel Green said, John has incomparable significance, is traced to his role as a precursor. So it was his proximity to Jesus. It was his nearness to Jesus as the last of the Old Testament prophets. All the prophets prophesied until John. So he's the go-between. That's what made him great. Proximity to Jesus. Now, seventh window. We are those who are greater than John. And this comes down to Case's question. Because Jesus said, the least in the kingdom is greater than he. Verse 28. John was the great, greater, there's no greater prophet than John, but he that's least in the kingdom is a greater than he. We know more, we have more, we're closer to Jesus than John the Baptist in his lifetime, in his lifetime. He's close now, closer now, 
but in his lifetime ever got to be. Here's a, a key, key thought and a wonderful thought. It ought to humble us to the depths of our souls. I have a greater position than John. You have a greater position than John. New Testament scholar Daryl Bach said of John the Baptist, he represented the end of an era and pointed to the dawn of a new era of realization in God's plan. Yet John's greatness is nothing compared to those who participate in the new era's blessing and benefits. John's re Jesus' remark in verse 28 is one of the greatest affirmations of the believer's status in Scripture. To belong to the kingdom is a great privilege. John is the bridge between the two eras. Um, we think we're privileged because we got computers and we got cars. And we got airplanes and we got this stuff. And that is a privilege, by the way. I'm not knocking that. Do you know the first president to ride in an airplane? Teddy Roosevelt took a, took a ride with one of the Wright brothers in their airplane. Spontaneously. I bet, I bet the Secret Service men were <laughs> freaking out on that one. And, but he was actually the first president to take a ride on an airplane. No president before him ever had that opportunity. And, uh, but now our presidents regularly ride on Air Force One. With the, is the helicopter Air Force Two? And something like that. Marine One, I mean, they got all kinds of things. R.T. France said, the age of promise is giving way to the age of fulfillment. Old covenant is superseded by the new. Jeremiah 31, 31, 34. So we have, there's a vast superiority of the privileges that we enjoy in the New Testament compared with the privileges the believers had in the Old Testament. Now, just think about this. If the least person in the kingdom is greater than John the Baptist, if the least one is. That means they all are. Right? If the least in the kingdom is greater than John the Baptist, then everyone in the kingdom is greater than John the Baptist. Everyone. Everyone that's in this kingdom Jesus is talking about, just an observation to make, is greater than anyone in the Old Testament. Sometimes we kind of wonder, I wish I'd have been in the Old Testament at the Exodus or, uh, you know, with Abraham or some of those people. That would be pretty cool to be with Elijah and some of that. Well, I do the same thing. I'd like, sometimes I think, oh, I'd like to be in the Old West and be at the cowboy. And then I read about cowboy days. And <laughs> I think, well, I'd like to go out back there for about two hours or <laughs> And then come back in a time machine. But we wouldn't want to live there. We have tremendous uh, position and tremendous privileges and st tremendous uh, spiritually. Alexander McLaren said, greater depends not on character but position. The lowest in a higher order is higher than the highest in a lower order. I'll say that again. The lowest in a higher order is higher than the highest in the lower order. Think about a basketball team, the varsity versus the um, reserves, right? The highest in the reserves is lower than the lowest in the varsity, and, and, and so forth. And everybody in the varsity is higher uh, than those in the reserves. So that's a picture here. So the lowest in the coming kingdom is greater in position and privilege than those before that coming kingdom. Now, let's ask this. Is the church the kingdom? Are they equated? No and yes. No, the church age is a lot different than that kingdom that Jesus taught us to pray for. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We now pray it for that kingdom to come. We are the church. There is a theocratic kingdom, a restoration of the kingdom of the Old Testament. 
And that kingdom is going to come when Jesus comes at the second coming. I'm, uh, I'm, a, I'm a, a classical dispensationalist. I believe that. And we are now living in a time of messianic, of the messianic king's absence. In, if we, we can even say it, between his reigns, between his first coming and second coming, according to Matthew 13. He's not on earth. He's ascended. And he's uh, in, in heaven. We're waiting for that kingdom. We're not in it. We're waiting for it. It's coming in the future for us. 2 Timothy 4.1, 2 Peter 1.11. We're not yet personally in it in the sense that we're reigning with Christ then. But we are going to inherit it according to 1 Corinthians 6.9, Galatians 5.21, Ephesians 5.5, 5, and James 2.15. 2, we're going to inherit it. We're looking for that inheritance. And we're not yet reigning. Paul said that in 1 Corinthians 4, 8, right? Well, you would reign, because then we could reign with you. So, we're, we, but we do have a position already, and I want to look at a couple of verses. Colossians 1, 13, and if you read Alva J. McLean's Greatness of the Kingdom, you know I'm, I've got this from him years ago. Colossians 1.13 Speaking of Christians, church saints who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. He's delivered us from the power of darkness. It's the same word. That word deliver is the same word in 1 Thessalonians. He delivered us from the wrath to come. Or in 2 Timothy 4.17 Paul talks about being delivered from the mouth of the lion. But here, every single Christian can give thanks to the Father who's made us fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who's delivered us from the power of darkness. The power of darkness is Satan. I have been delivered from him. He's delivered us. But there's a second thing he's done that goes with that. King James says, and hath translated us. Translated us. And that's, uh, ESV says, transferred, NIV brought us into, translated us. So I've, I've uh, been removed from one position, and I've been put into another position. And even the second word has the idea of removal. 1 Corinthians 13, 2, removing mountains, or 16 of Luke, verse 4, put out of your stewardship. I've been put out that I can be put in. I've been trans translated or transferred I'm brought into where have I been brought into into the kingdom of his dear son or the son of his love so if you're a Christian if you're a born again Christian you're a citizen of that kingdom even if you've never been there yet you belong to that kingdom you, you, have, you have a legal position there just like you're seated in heavens in Ephesians you got a chair in heaven with your name on it. You haven't been there yet, but you're there. And if you've ever gone to a motel and they've got something, welcome, Mr. Hickson, I'm talking about the fancy ones, <laughs> you know, and you've got the things in your room that are welcoming you, it's, it's kind of, oh, yeah, they're waiting for me. That's what heaven's going to be. We've got a seat in heaven with our name on it. Our names are written in heaven, and we belong there. We have translated into the kingdom of his dear son. That's our position in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Now, Matthew 13, 38 says we're sons of the kingdom. We're sons of the kingdom. In other words, church saints are the spiritual nucleus of that coming kingdom. Right now, we have the status as being sons of the kingdom. Fascinating. Now go back to Luke. The least is greater than he. The word least is, is mikros. We get micrometer from that and those kind of words. Mikros, it means little, least, and small. Actually, there's two Greek words uh, translated least in, or, uh, that translate the English word least in the New Testament, but mikros is the one used in our text. And it's often used of social standing. It's often used in verses that uh, talk about great and small, great people and small people. Acts 8, 10, 26, 22, small and great. 
same kind of thing in Revelation 11, 18, 13, 16, 19, 5, and 18. It's used a small statue like Zacchaeus, you know. He was a little guy. And the used of the tongue, which is a little member in James 3, 5. But uh, the closest text to us is in Luke 9, 48, if you go there. Start reading in verse 46. There arose a reasoning among them, which of them should be the greatest in this terrible that it happened. And Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a child and said unto him, Whoever shall receive this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him that sent me. For he that's least among you, the same as shall be great. <laughs> so <laughs> Jesus got different ideas of what greatness is, right? as far as practical life is concerned. But that's our same word. So, but our text, uh, back in Luke 7, refers to uh, the least in the kingdom is greater than John in the sense of this, greater privileges, greater position. And so, uh, uh, least in that coming kingdom has greater privileges and greater position than the greatest privileges or position in anybody in the Old Testament. John baptized with water, but John was never baptized by the Holy Spirit. We've been, and the early church was. Jesus baptized by the Holy Spirit. John baptized with water, but he was never baptized by the Spirit. There's another verse in Luke 10:23 and 24. Blessed are your eyes that see what you see, for I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see and did not see it and hear what you hear and did not hear it. Luke 10, 23, 24. I, I enjoy the Wright brothers. I like, I've read a, biography, a couple of biographies on them. I've been to their house up there in Greenfield Village and their bicycle shop and stuff. Fascinating people. Uh, they got an interesting bi biography, The Bishop's Sons, because their dad was a pastor. Uh, but probably got their smarts from their mom. But, you know, brilliant guys from going from bicycles to flying a plane. But would you want to fly in a modern jet with one of the Wright brothers as the pilot? No. <laughs> I mean, they, are, they were in their era, right? They were great for their era, incredibly great for their era. But there's no way that they could function in our era so many years later. Hebrews 11:39. Uh, these were all commended for their faith, yet none received what had been promised. God planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Writing about all those Old Testament uh, saints in Hebrews 11. Okay, one more window, the eighth window. A window into the greatness of Jesus. I don't know who the least in the kingdom is. Paul said he was the least apostle and the least of all saints. Maybe he's it. But there's been a lot of sinners after Paul, and I'm sure I'm under him, so uh, I don't know. But I do know who is the greatest in the coming kingdom. I do know that. That I know. Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And as the hymn writer said, the Lamb is all the glory in Emmanuel's land. Here... Jesus is making a really wonderful claim about himself. While he's vindicating John, he's validating himself in a marvelous way. This, turn, turn with me back to Malachi 3. You just have to look at the text. I know we did that once before, but it's not that far from Luke. Go back to Malachi 3. Malachi 3, verse 1. Behold, I will send my messenger. And that, in the New Testament, is John. This verse is used in every one of the four Gospels to refer to John the Baptist. 
God is speaking. If you go back to 2.17, uh, God is being criticized. And God is speaking here. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Now, the New Testament changes that in its translation. But the Old Testament text says, He shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. The me there is the Lord whom you seek. And he's going to suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. So John is the messenger. Jesus is the messenger of the covenant. And the messenger of the covenant is the Lord. And the Lord is God. So if John's the messenger, Jesus is God. <laughs> That's really... I, th I thought so much about this, I wrote my master's thesis about it. In Mark 1, 1 to 3. The same is true of Isaiah 40, verse 3. The voice that prepares the way in the wilderness make way for our God. The voice is John, and the person he's making way for is God. <laughs> and Isaiah 40, 1 to 3 is used in all four Gospels of John the Baptist and Jesus, just like Malachi 3 is. This actually takes your breath away. If you go back to Luke chapter 7, Jesus is vindicating John before the crowd. He's not a weak guy. He's not an effeminate guy. He's not even a prophet. He's the greatest of all prophets. He's the forerunner of the Messiah. And if he's the forerunner, he baptized me. He introduced me to Israel. I'm not only the Messiah... The, because, but because of the prophecies that predicted that the voice and the messenger would introduce God to the nation, I am the God incarnate Messiah. That's who I am. Jesus is much more than even John expected. He is not only the Davidic king, he's the God incarnate Davidic king of kings and Lord of lords. This is stunning. And it comes from his own mouth. You go back in Luke uh, chapter 7, I, I just get it. Get, let's just start reading in verse um, 26. But what went you out to see a prophet? Yeah, I say to you, much more than a prophet. This is he of whom it's written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, who shall prepare thy way before thee. The thee there is God quoting the Septuagint instead of the Hebrew text, but it's still God. But I say to you, among those that are born of women, there's none greater than the prophet than John the Baptist, and he that's least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. But this claim of Jesus in defending John is a declaration of his own incomparable significance. So, what a stunning thing. Leon, Leon Morris says at verse 26 and 27, it presupposes a full consciousness of the finality of his own mission to Israel. Jesus couldn't have said this if he didn't know who he was. <laughs> I'm not a Messiah. I'm the God incarnate Messiah. John was the greatest because he is the last in the line and after him, it's me, the fulfillment of all prophecy. It's incredible, stunning. Now, all of this goes back to Luke 1 and 2. And what early chapters of Luke were saying. In 115 and 17, in 135 and 143 and 176. All of this has been said before by those early prophecies comparing Jesus and John. So what do we have? What do we have here? Four more windows to add to the four windows last week. I'm the one using windows, the word windows here. These are spiritual picture windows to enable us to see significance of this particular section. 
But there's a problem. And as we conclude, I want us to think about this. Windows do nothing for blind people. When I add up these eight windows, and I I believe it's honest to deal with the text the way we have in these eight windows, I think, wow, this is good stuff. This is wonderful stuff. This is thrilling stuff. This is awesome. I, I see this. I see this. I see this. I see this. And I see this. And probably there's more windows here that I haven't seen that God has here that I haven't grasped. But more windows won't do anything if you're blind, whether you've got one or eight or something in between. A blind person cannot utilize a window to see anything. So we not only need windows, we need eyes. And we need light. And that's where 2 Corinthians 4 comes in. Turn there, if you will. 2 Corinthians 4. Because if the windows are there and wonderful stuff is behind them, the blind person can't see it. Blind people don't go window shopping. They can't do it. There's there's nothing for them to see. Remember the stores in the old days used to have windows full of stuff for you to buy. People would just go walk in the streets and go window shopping. Blind people can't window shop because they can't see. Paul understood that in 2 Corinthians. And he, he, he talked about when the Old Testament is read, there's a veil. And he says in 3.14, But their minds were blinded, for to this day remains the same veil untaken away in reading the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even to this day when Moses is read, the veil is on their heart. They're blind. They can't see what's right in front of them through the windows that God has put for them to see the significance, importance of stuff. And it's very important to add chapter 4 to chapter 3 because they're very much together. And Paul says in 4.3, But if our gospel be hidden, it's hidden to them that are lost. We know thousands of people that ourselves that we've met that don't see anything in the gospel. They don't see any significance, any importance, any validity. In whom the God of this age has blinded the minds of them who believe not lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine to them. I would a million times rather be blind in my eyes than blind in my mind. One very famous blind lady said, there's something worse than, than being blind with your eyes. And that's, thinking you can see spiritual things and you can't. Saying I can see, but you can't. And the God of this age has blinded the minds of them that believe not. And they, they believe they're right as rain. They think they got, the, they got the right position on everything and it's the Christians that are the ones that are in trouble. It's the God of this age has blinded the minds of them or not, lest the light of the glorious gospel who's in the image of Christ, should shine to them. Well, how does that ever get dealt with? How can you ever change that? We can't. All we can do is preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. But verse 6 is the answer for God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. The Genesis 1 God, who said, let there be light, has shone in your hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. What did Jesus say to Nicodemus? You must be born again to see the kingdom of God. You're, you're not only not in it, you can't even see it. It's something you'd want to be in. 
So the eight windows are here, whether people see them or not. And how many people, when you think about windows, only think about something on a computer? <laughs> I got Windows 10, I'm <laughs> whatever it is now. There's greater windows. And these windows that I believe that we've observed are really glorious, wonderful windows. I hope that they've been a benefit to you. And may God open your eyes if they're not, so that you can utilize them. And uh, because Jesus is in all of them in one way or the other. And as Paul said, beholding the beauty of the Lord, we are changed. Father, we thank you for the one who died for us and rose again. Speak to our hearts from this section of Scripture. Change our life. If anyone's not yet saved, if anyone's still blind, if anyone is still in darkness, translate out them out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of your love. In Jesus' name, amen.